Well, hey, podcast listeners, I'm TJ. And I'm Julie. And in episode 61 of the Pixar Post podcast, we're going to chat about our review of Incredibles 2, the movie. Woohoo! <laughs> That's not the official title, Incredibles 2, the movie. <laughs> um, and Spoiler free, yes. so don't worry. We're going to, I mean, I guess there could be a couple things that could be construed as spoilers, but we're really going to keep it top level. Yeah, well, it has to be spoiler free because only you saw it. I was not able to attend this screening. That's true, too. I don't so, want you spoiling it for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got it. Um, let's see. Also, we're going to talk about uh, John Lasseter's departure from Pixar. So we're going to go from like really jovial to kind of heavy. Uh, it's kind of, you know, we kind of feel bad combining these topics. We don't really want to put this into one, but, you know, it's the news it's that's the out news. there. It's what we got to talk about. Um, you know, we, we shouldn't shy away from it. It's something that needs to be discussed, mm-hmm. even though it's tough. You right. know, it's, it's bad on all accounts, but the news of Incredibles 2 is great. So what, what do you think? Would you rather talk about the Incredibles 2 first, or would you rather do I and think talk about... we should... Uh talk about the John Lasseter news first. Okay, perfect. So I'll high level it here. So essentially what happened is is that uh, last Friday, so June 8th, uh, John Lasseter announced he was, uh, that he'd be a creative consultant, kind of a, between John and Disney corporate. Bob Iger. Bob Iger, yeah, mm-hmm. that he would be a creative consultant that John would through the end of the year, and he wouldn't be returning after that. Um, and the again, this is on the heels of the, uh, the leave being announced in November 2017, May of 2018, when it should have been the six-month six mark sabbatical. that he yeah. was on a sabbatical, came and went, uh, and we didn't really know what happened from there, um, but all of a sudden this came out. And the, the week prior, Wall Street Journal had an article that said, we've heard some information that said he's going to be a consultant, mm-hmm. but then people weren't great happy about that, and so the hashtag Lose Lassiter started gaining momentum online where people were saying they need to get rid of him, he shouldn't be a part of the company anymore. It was sad to read those things because, and we'll get into this with our feelings, a lot of it is just bandwagon. People that are chiming in that have no information. Mm -hmm. And this is where... Very, very conflicting. Absolutely. And this is where it's tough for even us to discuss it is because it's Mm opinion-based. And we'll get into why it's opinion-based. So let's talk through what John Lasser's statement was. Then we'll read Bob Iger's, and then we'll go through our good, our bad, and kind of our thoughts of this. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as we're talking as well, um, we have our post that has this information on it. There's a forum topic that's out there that's had some people that are chatting back and forth, including one user that signed up with the username Frustrated and talked about why he thinks it's a bunch of rubbish, essentially. Um, Other people saying, like, you know, hey, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. It's got to go. So here's John's statement. So he said, the last six months, noting his sabbatical, have provided an opportunity to reflect on my life, career, and personal priorities. While I remain dedicated to the art of animation and inspired by the creative talent at Pixar and Disney, I have decided the end of this year is the right time to begin focusing on new creative challenges. I'm extremely proud of what two of the most important and prolific animation studios have achieved under my leadership, and I'm grateful for all the opportunities to follow uh, to follow my creative passion at Disney. So then this is what Bob Iger chimed in with. He said, John had a remarkable tenure at Pixar and Disney animation, reinventing the animation business, taking breathtaking risks and telling original high quality stories that will last forever. We are profoundly grateful for his contributions, which included a masterful and remarkable turnaround of the Walt Disney animation studios. One of John's greatest achievements is assembling a team of great storytellers and innovators with the vision and talent to set the standard in animation for generations to come. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what do you think about either John or uh, Bob's statements here? Uh, no, I think they're very well-written statements. I mm-hmm. think that's nice, you know, to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same point, I can't help but think, okay, the companies are you know the Walt Disney Company it's obviously the parent company of Pixar Animation Studios right is doing this because there were missteps quote unquote mm-hmm. that were mm-hmm. you know that happened that took place and that's what John said in his original in his original letter yeah. that said why he was taking his 6 uh-huh. month sabbatical and I there understand, was missteps and i understand as a company if said person is making people feel uncomfortable 
you, the action has to be taken regardless right. of who that person is. Again, we don't know anything, We, but that's my thought on it. Yeah, and this is where I get frustrated because I, I hear John saying his thing and you can hear that he's, you know, like, you know, with everything that's been going on, this is the right time to begin focusing on new things, meaning it's almost impossible to come back to mm -hmm. Disney and Pixar. Mm -hmm. And then you hear what Bob Iger says, where he talks about how profoundly grateful the contributions are. He turned it around. He's done this. He's done that. This is where I feel like the biggest letdown of this whole thing happened mm -hmm. is to me, there absolutely should have been an investigation. Mm -hmm. Because to me, if you're saying that this is the greatest person ever, he did something that turned around the animation for not just Disney, but for generations to come, right. for the industry. If you're talking about that and you think that these things are true, meaning that you say that these things are great things that he's done, shouldn't you defend that person? Shouldn't you try to either prove or disprove that? Like if, if John says, I didn't do it, or no, it's not to the level, clearly. I don't think anybody thinks this is to the level of Harvey, Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein or no. anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um. So I'm going to take a leap there and yeah. just state that as fact. Yeah. I'm going to say that we don't, nobody that I've talked to has said that this is to that level. But I also don't want to diminish it either. Right. Because like you said. If people were uncomfortable. Action needs to be taken. Yes. Yes. So this is the issue. And I also feel like if those said people were feeling uncomfortable, should they have to go through an investigation thing and feel uncomfortable again? That's the part that's conflicting. Right. You know, that, I mean, I get it and I get it as a company and I honestly think they probably thought about bringing him back, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, because of all, you know, everybody, you know, talking and like saying, no, you, he's got to go. He's got, how can you bring him? And I hate to say it, but you know, a man back into a, you know, right. You know, I know it's like a slap on the wrist kind of thing. And he's would be, he, he would he be noted as getting away with something? Mm -hmm. um, again, yeah. we don't know the severity of it, but that's just kind of, and that's the hard part is that, you know, when you think of these other cases, they've been pretty public in people that have come out mm -hmm. like, um, who, who am I thinking of that voiced Hopper and in, in a bug's life, Kevin Spacey, Kevin Spacey. I mean, there's an investigation. There's multiple people that have come out. Mm -hmm. There's people that have publicly said, you know, who they are, Every one of these sources about John Lasseter were anonymous. Mm -hmm. No one had said, this is who I am. This is what happened. This is why I am bothered. It was always, you know, oh, an ex-coworker heard from another coworker or prior, prior executive level people at Pixar or at Disney. There was, I just, I was always bothered by that, mm -hmm. that there was never a name to it. Mm -hmm. And as we continue to talk, you'll hear why. I was bothered by some of those things. But here's what bothers me the other direction. Not only if it weren't true, why would Bob Iger, with all of this pedigree that he just said that John did for mm -hmm. the industry and that John has, why would he not fight for him? Mm -hmm. So that's where I also have on the other side of my mind, like, crap, if he, if he did, if he didn't do it, right. fight for him. If he did... And you're just trying to mask it under this. That's what it feels like without having any further dialogue about it. Right. But then you yeah. think about the Walt Disney Company is a family company. Correct. And Pixar Animation Studios is very diverse, very, you know. Open to. Uh, open to, yeah. and everything. LGBTQ and rights right, right at the forefront. Yeah. And I just feel like the investigation wasn't happening because it's all about like it's a family company i felt like they they needed to keep they, it more quiet not that they could can't like protect their employees kind of thing but i think it might have gotten to the point where it's like when we're not we can't even though you are like the top guy when well, you know in animation these missteps ring yeah. bad for the anime but that's for where the it's, whole company that's where it's to me that if that's the case if they're like, if he really didn't do anything, 
And this is really a case of we can't investigate it because it might put us in a bad light. To me, that would be even worse because it's just like you're just turning your back on them. But think about it. I, and this is this is again just speculation. And but he admitted to having missteps. Correct. We don't know what those missteps are. Correct. D- Disney just the Walt Disney Company just spent what like a couple billion dollars building Toy Story Land Shanghai, Toy Story Land in Orlando, Florida, Walt Disney World, Pixar Pier, all these Pixar themed things that right. are happening. Right. And they just have like the head of Pixar. Right. That if they bring him back with these quote unquote missteps, mm-hmm. is that shining a bad light on this family company? And that's where that's the that, part. But that's what I'm saying, because that's what bothers me is in my mind that unfortunately the way that humans think mm-hmm. is that that leads me to believe that he's guilty because if he's innocent, there's no way that Disney doesn't just go. We're going to clear this up right away because investors Disney does yeah. everything to serve the investors. And this is a going to cause a panic. I'm going to be interested to see what's going to happen with the stock. I know that they were trying to uh, temper the reaction of the stock by saying, uh-uh, don't worry, we're not firing him. It's just, listen, shareholders, listen, it's <laughs> just a move to a six-month sabbatical. And then, like, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, listen, listen. You know, I wasn't well, saying listen yeah, to you. I was no, saying I know. Yeah, about, I know, I know. <laughs> but, like, you know, it's just like, and then now it's going to be like, it's these stages to walk people the investors into seeing that the company will survive without him. And they're going to put thoughtful, diverse people, man and woman potentially in these leadership roles at the respective Disney, Walt Disney animation studios. And, and Pixar I, do animation think, studios. I do think they're going to become separate again, where John was head of both. Correct. I think it's just going to be a Pixar oh, totally. director, you know, who will move up the ranks and then a Disney Director. Again, again, we don't have any information on this. Everything yeah. out there has said that they believe it's going to be uh, individual people as well. But I strongly feel that that will be the case. Right. I don't think that they could feel like they have somebody that could fill those shoes to and go I, across companies. And I honestly think during that six month sabbatical, that's when all of this was formed. Absolutely. Yeah. And then as he's going to stay on through the end of December of this year is as a consultant is when they're going to really work through the plan and say, here's what I did here, here's what I did here. This is going to be the succession plan officially mm-hmm. of John handing over the reins. Mm-hmm. But it still does bother me greatly um, that we just yeah. don't know anything. Right. And that's because the human mind wants to know it. We want to have a yes or no. Well, we want to be curious. right or wrong. Yeah, exactly. But, I mean, hum- people are curious about anything. I mean, that's why people slow down when there's an accident on the street. You know, <laughs> right. I mean, people look. Yeah. Right. So it's like we just, it's like <laughs> you, you want to know. And, but it's, and not it's only hard. that, but it's someone that you've looked up to. Exactly. And that's the biggest problem is you want to know if w- who you idolized for all those years was really as bad as it, your mind can portray it to be. Right. Well, is that, as we've seen on the media with these other people, Correct. you know, it's like, I don't feel the way, but again, again, I don't know. I was never in that situation so i don't know right the other thing that comes along with this is just you know the people people's reactions you read different comments on different posts we've been reading them on wall street journal and rolling stone and all these other sites that hollywood reporter variety all these others and the comments are all over the place they've got the people that are like this is too this is taking it the me too movement too far Mm -hmm. other people are saying thank goodness this is what needs to happen Mm -hmm. then you've got other people that are um chiming in and saying just some simply Disney and Pixar are done. There's no way that they can continue. And, you know, we've been chiming in on those comments. Yeah. Saying that, you know, no, no, that's not the case. No, because the talent in Pixar Animation Studios is unbelievable. And it wasn't just because it wasn't solely John Lasseter. Right. Um, I mean, he has a very creative mind. Don't get me wrong that he still has it. It's unbelievable. But... I mean, you think about all these directors. You think about the up-and-coming directors that are there. You mm-hmm. think about all the storyboard artists and all the other new talent that's coming in right. all the time. And it's just it's just a different... It's just evolving in a different way. It's just changing right. direction maybe a little earlier than we thought. Correct. Yeah, because ultimately, he was going to eventually leave anyways. Right. Um, 
but you're talking about people that have worked alongside John for 30 plus years that have information of working alongside him that are going to be Stanton, lo- Pete Doctor exactly Lee Unkridge. that are going to be able to carry that on mm-hmm. I mean people like even Dan Scanlon that worked yeah, side Dan by Scanlon's side with been him there since cars exactly he worked side by side with him in the story team and then also on the short um, that he did made her in the ghost light producers and, too that exactly yeah, I mean, exactly so Corey people. Ray's been there for so long right um, obviously, Darla K. Anderson left not too long ago as well. But it's just interesting that it leaves it so open. It kind of hurts mm-hmm. because we're just we'll just never know. And it's like anything when there's a loss. If you want to classify this as a loss, mm-hmm. y- nobody's ever okay with it because it's there's never a good time to have an end. Right. It, it just it always leaves questions. You know, it's a breakup where all of a sudden one person moved out of the country and you never heard what what the hell happened. Yeah, or, <laughs> yeah I know. And you go back and forth and then you think, oh my gosh, you know, the when you've seen all the studio behind the scenes tours and stuff and you know, Laster has that huge office yeah. full of toys. Oh my God. We Yeah, we talked about the dismantling of the office and well, how bad Will that, that still be there? No, they said that he, they said that he will no longer have an office. Oh, but at I didn't know studio. if maybe they would just like oh, keep, but they probably won't. Image wise, I don't think they would want to. Yeah, so it's just like that's like kinda, oh, this is the shrine to John Lasseter's office. People right. wouldn't like that. So. Because Steve Jobs still has a uh, room there, right? Uh, you know, I'm and not a hundred percent, but I do believe so. Yeah, I thought, yeah I'm not a hundred percent either. I thought they did. Right. In the Brooklyn I mean, he, building. I mean, he has the Steve Jobs building, oh, and yeah, they have I the know. tree. I, but I, yeah, right. but I, I didn't, couldn't remember if they, he still had like right. an office there. Right. I, I, I do feel like there was a slight misstep just overall with the whole thing, though. I think the whole sabbatical was partially to subside the investors, so it wasn't an immediate drop off of John leaving. But then I also think it was a little bit of well, maybe we'll be able to see if this movement kind of passes, and we can just whoop come back in it might have been but they had to have known that it's not that well, he wouldn't after it got going right. yeah yeah um so the other thing that i thought about just from a good standpoint um to put a positive spin on when people say that you know it's done now is you know if you think about john laster he had a formula most people have a formula mm-hmm. like sting has said it many times on his songs because if anybody listening to this doesn't know i'm like totally obsessed with sting and the police <laughs> um but he did a one like an unplugged or a, a vh1 thing a couple of years many years back 15 yeah. 20 years <laughs> i was gonna say vh1 is <laughs> <an> unplugged <laughs> you were a lot younger then <laughs> and he did he basically said that here's my formula to every song like it has like an intro it has like the verse it has the chorus and then i'm gonna go back to the verse i'm gonna have a bridge i'm gonna do the chorus. like he's he said this is every and then he said i'm gonna play one and you're gonna now see it mm-hmm. and you're like wow that's the formula the good thing is, is that with him, with with him also exiting, because mm-hmm. again, it was going to happen eventually. Right. Pixar and Disney knows the formula, but there might be somebody that wants to execute it slightly differently now. Mm-hmm. With it, also comes, you know, they don't have to follow it to the exact T that he did. Like I said, there could be somebody that's going to look at it a little differently. Mm-hmm. I just feel like sometimes when he was over films, maybe they were leaning on this, like we've got to get it done. And maybe we've got to get it out. It's going to be a predictable amount of money if we do this formula. I would like to see the formula shift it a little. Mm-hmm. You know, we had, like, we've talked, I think we might have mentioned it on here before. We've had it in side conversations. You know, all the movies had, like, the little kid at the version, at the beginning, the the, 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 char- the main characters as young characters at the beginning, babies, mm-hmm. infants, toddlers, whatever. And then it would all of a sudden flash forward after the first five minutes, and then they would be at the age they're going to be in the movie. And then it had the surprise twist villain. Like, it was definitely formulaic. Part of me feels like that is, you know, that that kind of started with, like, the whole Bolt trend mm-hmm. when he started at Walt Disney. I feel like that can get a nice rejuvenation to twist and switch that up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that everybody did that on every film, but you could see, like, you know, some of the Lasseter influence. This is going to make us money. People go, oh, when there's a little character, they're bought in immediately. Mm-hmm. And I can't disagree. Right, I, no, yeah. The beginning of Monsters University, Oh, young Mike Wazowski is like the cutest thing ever. ever. Yep. The beginning of Frozen, like those characters They're, are yeah. super cute being young. Mm-hmm. 
and it does it it, Im- it imbues you to those characters a lot earlier but i feel like yeah there's still times that that can be like click and shift and let's move forward so that's what i'll say for people that are being you know other people that are taking over we can see some more variance and difference potentially mm-hmm. just trying to put a little bit of a creative spin on it and then <laughs> i mean this this changes the uh the brain trust yeah, absolutely. At Pixar. Absolutely. And I wonder if this is going to change how the brain trust operates. Yeah. Well, so one thing that I won't say who's on it yet, but at the end of Incredibles 2, you have the Pixar creative senior creative team, which is essentially the brain trust that are all part of that. And like all of a sudden when Brian Fee's name showed up, we're like, hmm, what's he working on? Mm-hmm. And then you know we ask pixar and they're like well you know we'll let you know in the future when he's ready for his project and then of course then we find out he's on cars, cars 3. 3 so i started looking there's a lot of people that are in there now i i have a feeling that the, things it's just have different changed. and it's there just was different. there was like three people that were on for coco two or three extra names right there's a lot more now okay. yeah so i feel like they're i feel like they're adding more diverse more. uh you Women? know yeah there's definitely more um but yeah, it's just interesting to see that. We'll have to list all of them out because it was kind of just right past yeah. in the credits. But I definitely noticed a lot larger chunk mm-hmm. of names. Um, so yeah, so I'm looking at my notes as far as like, you know, the good, the bad, all that kind of stuff. So I, I think in general, and this is where I wanted to have, this is for me personally, where I wanted to have a yes or no. Mm-hmm. I wanted to have, because then I can just, I feel like I can move on. Like, okay, yes, or okay, no, great. Right. But now I know either way I have to move on with he's not there anymore, which stinks. Um, but what hurts for me personally, not only from an, you know, someone you look up to, someone that changed the industry, just as Bob Iger said, but he's responsible for creating some of the coolest characters, not even in animation history, in film history. Right. I mean, I know that he wasn't fully responsible for all of the design of Buzz and Woody. Yeah. But if I think of Buzz and Woody, those were his original ideas. And it was other people like a Bob Pauly and Bud Lucky Bud and Lucky. other people that worked alongside him to create the look. But he was responsible for like the, the lifeblood idea. of those people, the, the DNA of those characters. And that's where it just stinks to think that this was a possibility because it does take a little bit of a chisel to your childhood and just go like, tink, but I'm not letting it chisel anything away. The chisel's there, it's hitting, but nothing's chipping off in my mind right now because I won't have an answer. So I'm not going to let an assumption take a chunk out of that. Mm -hmm. So that's where I kind of want to just, at least in my mind, talk about what stung the most for me with this whole thing. I, I agree with you. The other thing that I can't help but also just think about is his family. I mean, Nancy was at all these premieres Mm -hmm. with John, and, you know, she never seemed like she was just there. She was a part of it. She seemed like she was, you know, independent, strong, on her own, and had all her own ideas and helped out with the winery. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there's all these other things that she did, too. And then his sons... um, who every year at the studio, he does a juvenile diabetes research uh, event where people can come to the studio, they donate, and they raise a ton of money. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to see that necessarily go away for juvenile diabetes research, Mm -hmm. but that'll more than likely go away because that's a basis of him. You know, so it's like that industry is going to get hit with a big loss there. So there's there's just so many bad things that I just don't, yeah. Love. And there's articles that have come out, you know, editorials that have come out from people that said they've worked with him for years that said, there's no way, this is not the case, this is not who I've worked with over 30 years. And they pointed out other inaccuracies in the articles where they talk about the fact that, you know, the article points out that it got to the point where nobody would take creative notes other than from Ed Catmull. And, you know, like people were like, no, that's not the case. Like he would say this, he would say that, you know. So it also, it just makes you feel like, okay, what about those inaccuracies in the article? How much does that lean on the inaccuracies? I know I'm circling the, you know, around and around on I this know, thing, and but it's just because I don't want it to be true. I, yeah. In my heart of hearts, I don't want it to be true. I, I know. And but I just, what, and that's where I have to play like the devil's advocate and be like, but what, what if part of it is true? Exactly. And someone was uncomfortable. Exactly. I don't know the 
and it's not even uncomfortable. The uncomfortable, or if they were violated. Yeah, or exactly. Felt. Yeah, I was gonna say. Violated. I was gonna say we can't even just say uncomfortable yeah. because if he truly did violate somebody's not only personal space but you know what we right. know as what's right and yeah. wrong, it was inappropriate. It's, yeah, then that has to be addressed. Yeah, but. I know, and then the whole comments of like he had handlers that would like stop him from drinking too much at parties and everything, and it's like those were, like I just want. Yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to hear that. Or I could envision that there was an article that went out, or an email that went out to all, all employees that said essentially, do not talk about this outside of. You know, this is going to be handled by Disney PR. Do not talk about this outside of the walls. But I would have loved if I could have heard something from employees. And I'm not saying that oh, I yeah. want that to happen because I know that that would put them in a precarious position. Um, and I know that's not professional to do. But it's, again, just it's satisfying and wanting that curiosity um, to be to be satisfied. Yeah. So. But again, I mean, we've seen John at an event one event that he was speaking at. So mm-hmm. we've never worked alongside him. We've Correct. never we don't interacted know the stories, with him. Right. The one time that we were going to, our schedules didn't. Correct. You know, yeah. It didn't work out. He no. had to end up taking off, but it is, it's just, um, you know, if, if somebody was affected, violated, however we want to state it, you know, obviously we want to be cognizant and sensitive to those people too. And don't want to minimize, to minimize it because of the artwork that he created. Because mm-hmm. you can create as many cool characters as you want, but that doesn't give you creative license to then touch somebody. Or, yeah. But since we don't have any answers, but we, don't know, we so. have to just look to a positive light to the future. We know what is happening now, and say, you know, Pixar is in. They are doing phenomenal. I mean, Coco is by far my favorite Pixar film. Correct. I absolutely love Coco. I can watch it like a thousand times in a row. No joke. Hey, you haven't seen Incredibles 2. Maybe you I don't know. know. But, and then when know. you came home and said how good oh, Incredibles 2 is, and I'm just like, okay, we're, you know, we're on a roll here. Right. You know, bow. Right. You know, Domi Shi, I mean. Correct. And she's she was greenlit to direct a feature film. Right. Or at least to continue to develop an idea, idea. which could be a feature film. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a lot of great movement that's going on that... You know, they're showing that things are moving forward, that things are being progressive. They've always been at the forefront of, you know, the uh, it gets better movement with, mm-hmm. you know, people that wanted to come, come out, out and say yeah. that they were, you know, LGBTQ. Yeah. yeah. And state who they were. They've been at the forefront of all of that. So I just I want people to continue to be positive about this and see that there is definitely creative and I think they have like, here. you know, a thing um, at the studio called, I think it's called Palette, where it's right. like, it celebrates diversity mm-hmm. within the studio. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I think they're well, we've, going in a fantastic direction. Yeah, I a, think they've always been going in a fantastic direction, but I think even more so now. Right. I think everybody's just more aware of it. Yeah, absolutely. This has definitely brought to light a lot of great conversation that's forced people's minds to think differently about things. You know, you can take Apple's slogan from back in the day, think different, and apply it to Pixar now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's interesting. We did have a, a side conversation with an employee that said that, um, you know, when we were talking about LGBT rights and that kind of stuff, and it just came up casually that, like, you know, oh, oh, yeah, I kind of forget that, you know, you guys are in Michigan, and I'm in my little world within Pixar working there, and, and then in California, where it's like, it all is so supportive that when you start to hear things elsewhere, it's like, oh, oh, yeah, that's not just I'm living in a bubble mm-hmm. in Pixar right. and in California. Right. That, that that it's so open and nobody thinks about. I mean, I shouldn't say nobody, but it's it's much more accepted. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyways, that's the conversation there. That's a ooh, 29 minutes of that. So <laughs> um, anyways, now let's talk about here's a hard shift to Incredibles 2. Da-da, da-da. <laughs> Um, wow. So, okay, so we were invited out to a midday, yeah, midday during screening. the week yeah. press screening. Yeah. It was interesting because usually they're at like 7 p.m. at a, at a theater and yes. this was at one o'clock. So and it was definitely my interesting. My mom can come over and watch our son, but right. nope, this was midday. I'm yep. a stay at home mom. Work, so, and your mom uh, was at work, so yeah. she couldn't uh, watch him. But um, 
So yeah, I went to this and we invited in turn our friend Giovanni, which you've been, if you've been on any of our YouTube Live or Google Hangouts, you've seen him been on there. Uh, he actually is uh, is in California as an animator, um, but is back in Michigan currently and was from here originally, went to college for creative studies. And so I was like, well, he's a great person to have come along. And mm-hmm. so he was in town. So I said, Giovanni, let's go. So we went, we recorded right after the movie ended. We went and sat outside the theater on a bench and we did just on the iPhone. I didn't bring anything else. I didn't bring a notepad because, you know, if you've watched those two, I usually always have my tons of notes, which I'm going to do next time I see it. <laughs> which um, is Wednesday. Which is Wednesday is the next time I'm going to see it at the AMC double feature. Um, but yeah, um, yeah. So we sat down, we talked through it. It's like 20 minutes. So get ready for that. We're going to get into that in just a minute or two because I don't want to say too much again because most of it's in, in there. But there's a couple things that I did want to call out. So first off, just as you see the movie when you go in, uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about, which I don't consider to be a spoiler, because it's pre the actual film start. But you know how they have like the the castle mm-hmm. that you know is different in different films. You know, Pirates of the Caribbean had the pirate flag on it. They do different things for different. You movies. know what? And that still bothers that me. That the Brave Castle couldn't be that there? That the Brave... Mm-hmm. Yeah, that they couldn't do the Brave Flag thing mm-hmm. on the castle, mm-hmm. that that was no... But now... Like Every Beauty movie. And, yeah, yeah. Beauty and the Beast, the live action one, was a different castle. You know, Pirates, mm-hmm. it was the Pirate Flag. Every time I see one that's different, I always think of Brave I know and it. Mark Andrews and Brenda Chapman and that that couldn't be done. Right. That was kind of... Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> It was kind of... I think of it every time. I know. I did. I thought of it when I was sitting in the theater. Yeah. Um, the opening is amazing, what they did to the castle. Okay. So I'll say that. But this is the first time that the Pixar logo was changed. And it is so cool. And it's not changed, changed. It's just the tone it's, of it is changed to match the film. It's incredified. Okay. <laughs> So, and here's what I'll say. So Matt Jones, uh, an ex Pixar employee, Mm -hmm. uh, chimed in and he put a tweet out that said, caught a screening of the Incredibles part du, uh, loved the stylized studio logos and make sure you stay for the closing title animation by John, uh, Holtzclaw, uh, Josh, Josh. Yeah. Josh Holtzclaw. Sorry about that. Um, picture has a gorgeous render quality plus production design. Ralph Eggleston and team knocked it out of the park. Josh chimed in and said, thank you so much, Matt. Uh, so glad you enjoyed it. Lots of work went into those studio logos. So I cannot even tell you how cool they are. Oh, I can't wait. I was sitting next to Giovanni and I just went, oh my God. And he's like, I know. <laughs> like it was, we talked about it and you'll hear us talk about it in the our, our review too. We talk about the only time that we've ever seen it change is that, you know, it was always the static 2D, you just saw it. Mm -hmm. But then eventually they did like the where it comes around it, like it it circles around the logo, makes it look like you're coming around from a different angle. Mm -hmm. But that that still was not changed to this level. It is so cool. And definitely stay through the credits. Okay, Uh, yes. So I have... Yeah. Stay through the end of the credits. Is there a scene at the end? Mm Mm-mm. Okay. At least there wasn't in this screening. Okay. I don't know if they're going to have something extra, but I doubt it. Um, I feel like it ends at the perfect spot. Anything extra would be like, "Mm, okay. Okay. So I feel like it's just good enough, but still stay because as... You see all the artwork. Yes. There's a ton of artwork that's during the credits, which makes it super cool. Plus you get to see all the names of the production babies and all the staff and everybody that worked on it from PR all the way up to, you know, the the, See who's changed and... Yeah. Yeah. We love staying through the credits. Well, you better. If you're listening to this podcast, you better. Yeah. (laughs) You're a Pixar fan through and through if you're listening to this. So, um, yeah, the movie itself, I mean, it's, you'll hear our review. I don't want to expound too much because then it's repeating myself, but it's amazing. It's, it's a ton of action. There's some things that I'm going to continue to think about on second and third watch. Um, but I'm placing it somewhere between a nine and a 10. Um, there, there's only one tiny, teeny, tiny moment that I felt like could have been edited down by like a minute or two. But if you're talking about over two hours, it's like 118 minutes or something like that, um, or just over, just under. It, it literally is like, if you're talking about one or two minutes, that is the only time in the whole time I was sitting in a theater that I was like, ooh, I might have, because usually I have little things in my head because I'm always analyzing mm-hmm. it. And you do too. Where oh, we're yeah. sitting there and we're like, oh, mm, might want to switch that or afterwards you think of things. I've still been thinking about it. And there's literally two minutes that I feel like could have been cut. That's it. Wow. So that's amazing. 
But uh, you, I know, I don't know if you talk about this in your review with Giovanni, but do you mention Dean Kelly's storyboarding in a particular scene? So I do mention that he did it. Okay. Um, but yeah, holy, oh, I can't. Yeah. So there's a there's a, a scene with Elastigirl that you see on her motorcycle. Mm-hmm. You know that if you've seen any of the previews. Yeah. Um, Elasticycle. On her Elasticycle. Yeah, Elastigirl, <laughs> Mrs. Incredible. <laughs> Helen, Helen Parr on her <laughs> on Elastic Elastic cycle. cycle. And there's just this chase scene that is just... It was boarded by Dean Kelly. Bo- yeah. They gave him... They said in one of our sessions that they gave him a pretty broad term of, you know, Mrs. Incredible goes on an incredible chase. And the way that Have he... Have fun. <laughs> the way that he boarded this out was... I would put this up against any action movie, live action, that has ever been done. I'm talking like racing through the streets in cars not in the movie cars but like car chases in action movies born think about like, like that kind fast, of stuff like fast yes period. it is just ridiculous i said this to i already i said this on our review that he's gonna totally i, I don't want to jinx it but i i have to say it he's gonna win an annie award for that scene for boarding that scene mm-hmm. and he i knew i it, i got triple confirmed because on his social media he posted the opening shot of that sequence and he said oh here's like an opening shot of the sequence i did and i was just like oh it's so good <laughs> it's it, it's amazing yeah it's amazing i mean you can't i i said it during i'll leave that for there i, I won't even go into it i, I it's like I, I gotta tell you this afterwards but uh yeah you'll hear it in the review with giovanni but um yeah there's it makes me wonder if he would ever direct I know not all Ooh. direct not all directors come from the story department, a but a lot do. Mm. But it depends on what he wants to do too. Yeah, he might. Not. I mean, he might not have a story. He might not want to pitch it. Who yeah, knows? He might, he might just be just the story like expert be... and just want to do that. Yeah, I mean, not everybody wants to. Yeah. But just because um, he's got such a different eye, it seems. And he draws okay. so fast and so detailed, it's sickening. Oh, it's. I'm so. I don't want to say jealous because jealous kind of sounds like. I'm envious. Yeah. But the thing that's great about the story department in general is that if you get into that department and your job is a story artist, you are refining your craft minute by minute because you have to do so many hundreds of drawings a day that literally like you can get to that point where you can get a lot more detail in a lot less time. Mm -hmm. But like if you or I were to start doing it or even a beginning animation student or somebody that just started in that department, they're going to be slower. Mm -hmm. But like they have an idea how they're going to block things out a lot quicker. And it's just always honing their craft. Yeah, it is. Well, you have to. I mean, you do in all departments because like, you know, oh, they didn't use these specific lens profiles before. Now Mm -hmm. they are. It's like, you know, and then the next movie, they can do that again. Oh, speaking of that, one thing I didn't talk about in the conversation with Giovanni Holy cow, there is some amazing handheld shots, um, which we know from the interview we did with um, Patrick Lynn, mm-hmm. uh, as well as Sashka Unseld on The Blue Umbrella. That The Blue Umbrella was the film that pioneered that they brought that live action where they actually have like a motion capture camera that actually does and mimics in the film what motions they're making as they walk through a empty studio. Mm-hmm. And... Whew, they took it to another level again. There are some amazing handheld shots, especially at the beginning. It, it cools down a little bit as the film goes, but at the beginning, it is wow. Wow. I just... Why can't I watch this movie right now? <laughs> <clears throat> well, I said that in a tweet. I said the worst part about Incredibles 2 is that when it ended, I wasn't able to watch it again. That's the worst thing I can say about it. Well, and I know I s- you came home and you were just like, it's amazing. I can't, and I'm just It's because like, the action is so good. I mean, you're not... You, you said not only the action, but the story. Yeah, the story is great. You're going to get these good tender moments in it. You're going to get the huge action in it. But it's, it's definitely, if you're talking about like Coco... You've mm-hmm. got a lot more story and emotion in it. This is weighted the other direction with a lot more action mm-hmm. and a little less story. But the story still has some great heart. And there's some really, really cool parts with Mr. Incredible where he has like a a moment um, with himself. And they, they all have these... There's great character arcs. Multiple characters are having arcs at different points throughout the movie. And the fact that Brad Bird handled this all on his own is just, like, ridiculous. Like He said that's, like, how he wants to work, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, 
Michael Arndt, I believe, was brought on as a consultant. Um, but I don't know at what stage that was mm-hmm. because Brad talked about that he had to just keep scrapping things and starting over and starting over and starting over. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. It just... Well, do you guys talk about the music? Yeah, we talk about that. Okay. Yeah, it's great. You guys are going to love it. I mean... Well, let's listen ja- to it. <laughs> Jake- okay, you're right. Let's listen to it. I could continue to talk about this, but what we're going to say, and I think I mentioned it in there too, now I'm forgetting because that was a couple days ago, but we're going to definitely have a live discussion where we talk about you know, our review of this. So stay tuned, watch for our yeah, once notices. I see it. <laughs> yeah. And watch for our notices on YouTube where we talk about like, you know, that we're going to be having a, a, a live hangout to, to discuss all this so that you guys can join the listeners as well and give us your thoughts and feedback so we can Probably share some after of those. opening weekend. That way yeah. It'll be after opening a, weekend. Yeah. Get a chance to see it. Yeah. So, wow. So get ready, stay tuned. Here's our interview with Giovanni and myself as we walked out of the theater and then uh, we'll pick up at the very end here. So this is going to be in our podcast. Um, I am actually just got out of the theater with our good friend Giovanni here. Hey there, everyone. If you've been on the, any of our live hangouts, you may have seen him before. Uh, essentially, we got out of Incredibles 2. Uh, first reactions. Amazing. Okay. And I'm sorry. Better word. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah. All right. So, yes, it absolutely was incredible. The thing that I kept thinking throughout it, the first thing was Brad Bird is a genius. Absolutely. He is a filmmaking genius because as you watch the scenes unfolding, you start to see how they're framed. And I know that obviously the story department is involved with a ton of that too. And, you know, the layout team and all. There's, everybody's involved. But when we chatted with Brad Bird at the studio, he talked about the fact that, you know, why would another, why would another director have a co-director? You don't want to give up any control over it because he has the ultimate vision and I feel like he really drove it and there was just so many amazingly laid out scenes and we can't t- we're not going to talk about spoilers on <laughs> this but Screenslaver what did you think about Screenslaver first off thought it was really interesting how they did it definitely a different kind of villain um, okay uh, I don't know what would what, 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 what would you yeah so the one thing that I I won't go too spoilery, but I'll say something that, you know, my, he has a, uh, a location. Yes. Screen Slaver has a location that he operates out of, and that was so different for Pixar. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. The style felt totally unique. Um, the, the, just the imagery, the closeness of it. And seeing that scene is one of many scenes where you're really just on the edge of your seat the whole time. Yes. It's just it's, it's part, part of many where you're just like something could happen at any moment and that's this whole movie this yeah. whole movie is just an adrenaline but there's also great comedy mixed in it's just yeah. a, it's a beautiful yeah yeah it's touching yes there's yeah. moments where you know like uh, between Mr. Incredible or I should say Bob I always call him Mr. Incredible yeah. Oh, yeah. but Bob and Violet had some nice moments oh together. absolutely yeah great um, family moments throughout the whole film I, yeah. I thought you know um uh, da- yeah, great father and son stuff with Dash and Bob, and yeah. the, fe- the the fellow who voiced Dash in this film. Oh, um, Huck Huck Milner. Oh my goodness, he yeah. just stepped into that role like it's always been his. It, like, it, it doesn't it, feel it, any it, different. No, not at all. He did one, and he has some of the best lines of the film. Like, okay, so when when Nemo had to get a new voice, you know, when you when you, when they premiered it at D twenty three, it sounded pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. This like, I I could have never thought you could have no. found somebody that sounded. Exactly. Oh, like yeah. in when Finding Dory came out, I was like, okay, I can tell it's a little different. Mm-hmm. This I can tell yep, not there, one different. There's, there, yeah. In fact, I would almost say it even sounds a little better. It feels more like Dash than the original Dash. Right. Yeah. He he, he just took that character, <laughs> ran with it, and uh, and just yeah, a- absolutely. I, Ins- I loved him. Insanity. So yeah, um, like we said, not a wasted shot. Tons of energy and action. Okay. The one thing I will say, the opening. The very, very opening. Should we talk about that with the castle? Yeah, we. I, I mean, it's not too spoilery. Yeah, it's not for too spoilery. Yeah. Okay, so you know how in recent movies Disney has been doing where they transition the castle into a theme after the movie. So you know, in Pirates, even they put the pirate flag on mm-hmm. top of it. And what are some of the other movies that they've changed um, it over? Tron. They've done it yeah. for. They've done it for a lot of the animated films too, like right. Lilo and Stitch. Um, so yeah, for years they've been always. So yeah. that was like one. Of the, I was so excited to see that I leaned over. And I was like, the castle. Yeah. They changed yeah. the castle. Yeah. And what's 
What still bothers me, though, is that they wouldn't allow it to be changed for Brave. Um, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but for this one, though, it's very stylized. Oh, yeah. Very stylized. It fits Incredibles perfectly. It feels very much like Teddy Newton style, um, you know, when he did all his original concept artwork mm -hmm. and some of those sharp edges that he created for the characters. And he was, again, a consultant on this film. So that's cool. Um, but it came up, <clears throat> and yeah, we both were like, oh, my God. So that was awesome. Mm -hmm. But then the first time ever that I'm aware of that they ever changed the Pixar logo with the lamp. Yeah, the only other time I think they ever did like something different was when 3D started getting big and they did oh, and that they twist they did that sideways twist but never like a a color a color change. Yeah, it's a color like shift. Yeah, it's yeah. very different. You yeah. guys are going to love it. Yeah. And it absolutely brings you immediately into the film. It it took away all of like the whole like oh brought to you by all that mm -hmm, kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Not that I don't get excited as yeah, a Pixar yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. and Disney fan seeing that. But that part was amazing. The other thing that I thought was super cool uh, tying into, and we're going to talk about this next, is Giacchino's score. Oh. But when the castle came up, and again, it's stylized, it comes up. You know how it gets like the, the Tinkerbell sparks mm. over the top of the castle? If you, it was bongos, like, oh. it was bongos, and it was transitioning from the right speakers to the center above us. Look over at you. To the wow, left. holy Toledo. I, <laughs> I can't wait to watch it again just to, I missed there that. There is so much that I. I did not bring a notepad into this one. Uh, part was because I forgot it, but the other part was I was I said told myself I don't want to go in and, and do it for the first watch. I don't want to look down at all. I couldn't have. I couldn't have looked down because you miss something in a half a second. But so that really with that arc of like that's the Tinkerbell spark or the, the fairy dust trail coming over the top, like I was like, okay, this is gonna be an amazing Giacchino movie. And it absolutely was. What did you think of the score? Oh, it'd be perfect. Perfect score. Because um, we all know the Incredibles, uh, the original Incredibles score is so iconic. So this one just is. delivers that same amount of just epicness yeah. that just complements the movie so well the whole way through. Yeah. So. I mean, it was crazy just hearing some of like the, the more subtle moments. I can't wait to pick to hear the soundtrack. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. at, the end of the, at the end of June that it's coming out. But I can't wait to hear some more of that to determine what, like some of the titles are now i'm going to go back and look at the titles now that we've seen it mm -hmm. and see where they kind of match up but i didn't hear any like other than the incredibles theme i didn't hear like a screen slaver theme no nothing not yeah but the music would slow down a little mm -hmm. bit yep so it, it was almost like the slower horns um yeah i gotta digest that again to fully but i can tell you that at the end you know when the when the, the film is wrapping up i'm not going to say anything about it but at the end it was amazing too like that it felt like now you've got a little bit of a refreshed theme. Yes, coming yep. into the end mm -hmm. when the it's got that familiar to it, but it's also but like it you said, it's got a new a new kick to it as well. It, it did, yeah. It was definitely a little up, more upbeat and jazzier, mm -hmm. and you could tell he kind of stretched himself a little bit. And I still think that Chikino, with his experience on the first Incredibles, that kind of fed some of the the background of Zootopia soundtrack because that feels very much like that, heavy on the mm -hmm. percussion and drums. Um, and the really upbeat nature to it, but this <clears throat> this one, excuse me, brought it right back to like that jazz undertone mm -hmm. with it, which just works so well, so well with keeping the energy and action going. All right, what about the animation? Oh, I I mean, just crazy stuff they so do. So you these, obviously these, know yeah, this. Yeah, so the, the rigs they do, the thing, and I, I, little things like I just there's a lot of you know a lot of great moments in this film where characters are talking, just interacting. Yes, and. They're, they feel so different. They feel like the, the acting choices in each scene were carefully chosen. I, I was watching, yeah. I was watching, and like for different characters too, little things they did. Everything yeah. is so well thought out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I loved it. And of course, I just all the, I'm just like watching the watching these scenes, like Mrs. Incredible, like on her bike. That like the scene oh, where the scene where she's on her my bike. God. I'm just saying, the animators who did this scene just. It, so that was amazing. You're talking about the with the train. Yes. Because yeah. we, we know that there's a train. If mm -hmm. you've paid attention to anything of it, there's a train involved. And you know she has an elasticycle. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a scene where she's essentially <clears throat> in pursuit of that train. Mm -hmm. And that was boarded by Dean Kelly. Um, the team, like Ted Mahat, the, the, the story supervisor, um, he was saying that, you know, we gave Dean this really broad sense and said you know this is going to be an action scene boarded out so that was essentially a lot of his mm -hmm. doing and that scene blew me away 
absolutely blew me away. I've been dying to talk about it, and I can't <laughs> wait to talk about it more when I can spoil it more. But literally, when I was at the studio and they showed us that scene, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. The angles... The cut speed. Is that what it ended on when you when like what you what you yeah. saw? Oh my gosh, what a t- like they, they show you that and they're like, and then we'll we'll show you the rest in a, in a little bit. That's where it ended. <laughs> oh yes. my gosh. But literally, like I just can't even. I, I can't even. So Dean Kelly, he's you know if you've followed our site, <clears throat> he kind of was under the radar for us at first, and then he started winning a whole bunch of Annie awards when we were watching those and seeing you know what was happening there. And then you start hearing people in the studio kind of chattering, like going, oh, D. Kelly, D. Kelly. He has like a mystique about him. Um, other people do, of course, as well. But there's just something that like, you know, they say they can give him almost impossible scenes. He can board it out to make it this incredible action sequence. And that sequence did not disappoint. No. The second time I saw it, I was je- my heart was racing just as much. I could feel, I could feel an elevated heart. Yeah, rate. you already knew exactly what was going to end. Yeah. yeah, you were just, yeah. You know what I realized I should do is I should, since I have the Apple Watch, I should hook it up one time and track my heart rate. Oh, you should? <laughs> while I During watch this, the movie I mean, to see how it aligns to the scenes. Heck, this is going to be the up the whole, the whole way through <laughs> it that, yeah, with that film. Yeah, that's a great <sighs> idea. So back, so back to the, um, you know, the animation. Um, you mentioned like some of the subtle nuances mm-hmm. and everything like that. There were really great nuances. Mm-hmm. Like just how a character would move even in the background a little bit. Um, I loved the animation of some of the 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 wannabe supers especially oh, we, oh, screech oh yeah with the head turning the and head everything turning? That is, yeah just capturing that the uh, essence of an owl just perfectly because his head can turn 360 mm-hmm. degrees like it was so cool but like you know just even and in, boyd's like nervous kind of like her, yeah. you know her nervous nature had captured perfectly you can just feel her sort of yep. just how excited she is to meet you know elastigirl absolutely um some of the the nuances with uh, mrs incredible as she was torn and they were having okay, all right. How real was this scene when they were when when and we saw it in some of the previews. So again, I'm kind of pausing just to make sure in my head as I'm thinking it through that I'm not going to spoil anything. But where they're talking about you know should Elastigirl, should Mrs. Incredible, Helen go off and do this, and Bob is having their conversation back and forth. That's such a real moment again. Mm-hmm. Just like again, yeah, so many scenes just to, of just talking, but. They, they carry so much weight to them. You're right. so invested watching these scenes, you know? Like, that's just crazy how an action sequence can have as much weight as just a talking scene like in yeah. this film. Yeah, no music. Yeah, no, yeah. It's just yeah. quiet in mm-hmm. the bedroom, and they're ha- having a conversation back and forth. And yeah, just just as much weight. Mm-hmm. Just as much weight in his importance, and, and you get bought in immediately. Um, how about... How about as far as the uh, characters themselves? We haven't talked about the... The characters. Oh, yeah. I mean, n- none of them disappoint. I was, every time a character is on, see, uh, on screen, I'm o- Jack Jack. I mean, again, without saying too much, he's, he's just. He's, he, a, he's a scene stealer. Yeah, he is. He definitely. Uh, Dash, I think, is a scene stealer, too. Right. He just. Uh, um, but he, I, I loved Violet. Like, I, you just. You, right. you love them all. And, of course. Yeah, Violet had, Violet had probably. Probably the biggest arc. Mm hmm. Well, in terms of, like, sub characters. I mean, she may, well, she may have even had the biggest one. I don't know. Well, I'm, just, we're gonna have to, I'm gonna have to digest yeah, that yeah, some more. Yeah, absolutely. But she had a very big arc mm-hmm. as far as just understanding what's happening and being a teenager and fighting through yeah, that de- as well. You de- yes, absolutely. Yeah, and then uh, Dash, he didn't have so much of an arc as much as like the comedic relief. Yes, and, absolutely, like, yeah. His attitude mm-hmm. and his styling was just hilarious. Um, but yeah, but and Bob Bob too, I think had a great arc of just kind of having that acceptance. That's, you're right. You, you know that he had a good one too of you know kind of putting aside that super life. You know, let Elastigirl girl do her thing and that family life. That's a I just really liked his uh, his growth as well as, yeah, a, as a father. There's a lot of arcs going mm-hmm. on because yeah. then you think about Mrs. Incredible having her arc with you know being okay with being in the spotlight mm-hmm. right? instead right. of taking that role, even though she kind of wanted it, she also mm-hmm. kind of held back a little bit. Right. So that was a cool arc. But what did you think about the, the wannabe supers? Was there any of those moments or those characters that stood out? Um, I'm trying to think. I really, their powers are great. I think that, I think they're, they're uh, what they gave them. I love their, their looks and I, w- I wanted more of them, honestly. I, I, yes. I, I wish there was even more of them. That's yeah. like, it's like, again, I, just like I told you, teach Lato's gang. I, yes. I, I, they, they're there. They look cool. You yeah. know they're cool, and yeah. you want even more of them. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And then, how's about um, 
Hmm, which direction do I want to go now? Um, oh, also with Edna. Oh, yeah. Okay, so did you want more Edna, or did that feel right? Um, like, yes and no. Like, like what we got was yeah. perfect, but at the same time, you could always have more Edna. And it's, and, 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 and you, but, but what they did, what they gave us was, I thought, it's, that it's was perfect. Great. Yeah. yeah, so that was great. I, I said this at the studio. People disagreed with me as far as uh, that we were sitting next to, that I was sitting next to some of the other media sites when I was at Pixar. And they said, no, 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 it should, it should have been gone. I shed a tear. I shed a tear about Elastigirl's last cycle. Not really. Oh, but... I know. I was bummed. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. It's I wanted such... more, of the, more of the bike. <laughs> yeah. I wanted more of the bike. Especially because that scene, too, where you see it and it's just like, you're it was like what, what she's doing with it. It's yeah, like, it was incredible. Yeah. It was incredible. All right. Uh, closing credits. Um, you know, a lot of movies, a lot of times they have a, a scene that pops up after. Mm -hmm. um, unless it's different in this screening, I didn't see anything. Right, yeah. But you still should stay through the credits, of course, because yeah, the you never, animation it, it, was yeah. really cool. Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, just if, yeah, if you love the, 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 especially the beginning of the credits at the end of the first film, you're going to love these. You're going you're gonna to love them. Yeah. So. And I did like that they incorporated at points... 2D animation on the TVs that they were watching. Yes, yeah, lots so, of great, so for great animation, 2D stuff in this film. You know, I mean, yeah. just like like, and the and the design, you know, the uh, 2D just artwork throughout the film. Like on a cereal box, I find myself staring at like cereal boxes and stuff, and just saying like, wow, the artwork, the time, the sugar that was, yeah, <laughs> sugar bombs and yeah, fiber O's. Yeah, yes, right, yeah, I love that fiber O's <laughs> box. Yeah, that, yeah. So just little things like that too. Everything is so, you know has so much care and passion as crafting yeah. to it. Did so. you see they craft, they, they, somebody made those at the studio? What? <laughs> yeah. So somebody took but, a picture and shared it. I can't remember. It was one of the employees. They shared a picture of it. They essentially took a regular cereal box and just did a wrap oh, around yeah. it. And they left them in the cereal room. Oh, and they awesome. were like, hey, what is this? How did these <laughs> get awesome. here? Yeah, that was cool. So, um, yeah, all in all, I mean, we can't say too much more mm. without revealing a lot more about the film. But all in all... First impression, what do you think as far as on a 1 to 10? Oh, these, these numbers. Because, cause like, I, like, I always, you know, you've asked me this for 10. I just, I really, like, like, this is like a thing where when I was watching this film, I really didn't have, like, again, we, we said moments where I went, oh, that could have done without that scene. There, there wasn't, you right. know? And uh, I really can't find a place in this movie to, I mean, to really fault. I know it's always, it's always especially great right coming off the, the the uh, right out of it, right? You know, but anything that you, what would you give it? So, well, the the hard part is, is when I when I do this coming out, I immediately am all jazzed up still. Yes, and absolutely. I'm feeling it, you know. It, it, so I would say a ten as well. Yeah. I mean, do you do you do you find yourself comparing it to the first one while you're watching it? Do you like? Or did, Ooh, did you, did you good ever, question. Do you ever go, oh, this, you know, this reminds me of this, or oh, in the so, film, the okay. you know, they've done this by this point. Right. So this is what I love about Brad Bird and originality on it. You know, Finding Dory, I love the movie. Mm -hmm. Don't even think that I'm going a different direction with this. But there are elements of it where I felt it had too many callbacks to the first film. Okay. Too many, like, okay, they did this, so now they're going to do this. Right. This character comes around, you know, they, they had the, the seagulls and all these other things. Mm -hmm. You know, like, too many callbacks at, at times. This, I don't feel like, had really that many callbacks. No. No, not. I mean, there were things that shadowed a little bit or mirrored slightly just because of the role reversal yeah, yeah and i and i feel like a lot of people in the beginning because you're know, only seeing previews are like oh i see it's kind of the same thing with you know helen doing bob's role in the first room but you gotta that is like totally out the window right. i feel like the the trailers are really setting you up to like surprise you with a really fresh and original and that's thing. great yeah and that's great yeah. um so yeah, I think this is going to have a big rewatchability. Mm -hmm. Are you you're going to nice. see it again? Oh, absolutely. I can't, <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to go in and now second you find your Easter eggs and find everything else. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll also say this. It was very difficult to see any or many of the Easter eggs. We yeah. found A113. Yeah. That was that was, was that pretty was pretty, pretty good. Yeah, pretty, yeah. Uh, we believe we have an idea where the Pizza Planet truck yeah. would be, right. but we're and not, if not I mean and if, and if we're going on uh, Incredibles 1 who knows if it's even in there? Could Ooh, that's have, could true. Have just been like we didn't put in the first one. Or, <laughs> or we can't say anything other than this. But is it possible that just the idea of it is, is in the movie? Oh, that's a good idea. That makes sense. Is it never shown, but the idea of it is there? Yeah, because that, of the character. That's a good, a, a good, nice way to sneak it in without actually being there. That would be innovative. Yeah, yeah that would. Yeah, that would be innovative. Um, <clears throat> yeah. 
I think this is going to break some records for sure. Oh, yeah. uh, the word of mouth, which we always talk about mm -hmm. in our reviews, is going to be very high for this yeah. film. And it was already tracking with pre-sales being yeah. a huge opening, right? Yep. So. Yeah, so I think this is definitely going to... I mean, I don't... It's, you know, some people say it's like you shouldn't put, you know, count your chickens before they hatch right. and you don't want to curse it. Right. But I've got the billion dollar vibes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, people, <laughs> pe people always, say, oh, yeah. People yeah. always say, like, this is the sequel we waited for. We waited 14 years for it. And you, you want to know what? You did. It was, it was, you waited and it was worth it. It was what, definitely what you get was worth def it. was definitely worth it. And I, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, people have talked about the technology the whole time. The technology was incredible mm -hmm. in this, how much it's advanced. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, I won't. I won't say yeah. what it was, but you see a scene that was a very quick one at the beginning that's recreated, um, yes. shot for shot, whatnot, yep. and just seeing it with new rigs, new technology, right. and everything. It's just you're like I. I did a little like wow, like when I yeah. saw it, because like just like you see how far the, you know things oh, have come. It's drastic. Yeah, drastic. Um, so, anyways, uh, there's without a doubt we say go see it, mm -hmm. and. Uh, be sure to stay tuned because we're going to have, once the movie's out broadly, maybe that weekend or the or right after the weekend, we're going to have a, a live hangout, a YouTube live, to, to talk about all of our reactions. So we're going to be looking for your feedback on it as well, as far as you listening to this right now on our podcast. And just more to come. Get ready. Take notes. Write them down when you get out of the theater and share them with us because we want to hear what you think as well. You can, of course, go to PixarPost.com for all the latest Pixar news. You can go to the forum. You can chat about all of your thoughts on the movie. You can leave a review on our site, on the comments. You've got lots of different ways to talk about this, but we definitely want to hear what you think. So that way we can share it on our live hangout. Or if you join us on the live hangout, you can just type it right in the chat and we'll hear it as well. All right. Thank you, Giovanni, for joining us. Of course. And, yeah. And thanks for having me. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we are excited after our early screening of yes. Incredibles 2. And I'm going to be seeing it again next Tuesday. And I'll, I'll at, be seeing at the or next Wednesday at the uh, the double feature. You are? Me too. Are you, <laughs> yeah. Which one are you going to? Forum 30. Oh, I'm going to the oh, okay. one in uh, Yeah, but Livonia. I could, could yeah. miss that. You, especially how they like start and end. Yes. Right next to each other. It's yeah. like perfect to watch it yeah. together like that. So I'm going to go see it again next week, and then I'll see it again on opening night, and then we'll go from there. All right. All right. Let's talk to everybody later. Bye. All right, well, that about wraps up this episode. Be sure to follow us on all of our social media channels, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, or subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. Lastly, if you like today's show, let us know. Rate us on iTunes, leave a comment on our site, or send us an email at info at pixarpost.com. Signing off as usual, I'm TJ. And I'm Julie. And be sure to stay tuned to pixarpost.com all week for the latest Pixar news. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.